Chris is director of the Living with a Disability Research Centre at La Trobe in Melbourne. Chris is a leading researcher in the field of intellectual disability and her applied social research has contributed to understanding about policy, programs and practices that are effective in improving the social inclusion of people with disability. Um, Chris is currently leading two studies funded by the ARC. The first is investigating ways in which to embed um, active, person-centred active support into everyday staff practice uh, in supported accommodation. And the second is a four-year study trialling um, evidence-based resources aimed to increase the capacity of decision-making uh, supporters of people with a cognitive disability. I'm going to talk about some of the findings from, from our research and uh, a practice framework that we've developed from that evidence um, and, and now trial that we're going to conduct. Ah, okay. So I think we're fairly clear now, having heard Tim, that there's a new paradigm around support, supported decision making, which is based on the premise that everybody has the right to participate in decision making about their own lives. That the job of everybody that's involved in people's lives and of society is to provide sufficient and effective support tailored to that individual, to enable them to participate. And they can participate in lots of different ways. It's about having changed expectations of the other people around them that they can participate and can be involved in decision making. It's about developing that person's skills and experience of making decisions, whether they be big or little. It's about providing support to that person to express their will and preference. And it's also, as Tim has alluded to, about interpreting that person's will and preferences. And those, those principles are, to some extent, clearly embedded in the Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and the legal uh, debate that's gone on around that. But also they're embedded in the Australian Law Reform Commission report in 2014. So this is sort of a direction that Australia has clearly started to, to go down the path of. Just to take a moment, it's worth thinking about what are we talking about when we talk about decision making and participating in decision making. We all make hundreds of decisions every day and it's important to think about the different ways of describing decisions. So you can think about the scope, the smaller day-to-day -day decisions, how long you're going to have a shower for, whether you're going to have a shower or a bath, what you're going to put on. All those sorts of things are decisions that are really important to people's sense of autonomy and well-being. And then there's the bigger decisions, which are the more enduring things that, that have longer term implications, like where are you going to live, what colour are you going to paint your bedroom, who are you going to live with. And those sorts of things often require interface with other people or for people who have complex support needs often interface with a range of different support people and support systems. There's questions about who's going to be involved in that decision, who has a stake in it, who's going to be affected by the decision that you might make. There's the constraining influences like the law, like resources, finance, reality. Um, Things about the time frame, do you have to make that decision today, now, or can it, can it be taken over a period of time? What, obviously, what are the consequences and what are the potential outcomes of the decision that you make? So making decisions is not a simple, a simple thing. It can, can be very simple, but it can also be very complex. And every time you make a decision, it often is then embedded in other decisions. So it's a cumulative type of process. Um, and nobody makes decisions independently. It's clearly an interdependent process. And I think if you start with that, bear that in mind, it makes the idea of support for decision making a much easier uh, idea to, to get around your head with. So if we look at the idea of de de delivering decision making support to people, uh, to ourselves and to people who have cognitive disabilities, it happens in lots of different ways. So it happens in developing your own skills around decision making. It happens, as in Canada, through legal schemes like rep agreements, like uh, microboards. It happens primarily in Australia through informal reliance on close family members, 
on paid support staff and on other people who are around you. It also happens through advocacy organisations and it happens through the everyday staff practices of the people that are supporting the person with cognitive disability. So there's lots of arenas in which decision making support is delivered. One of the difficulties is that there's very little evidence about the actual practice of delivery support. Tim's talked at length about the situation in Canada, but when you go to the literature and you say, so actually how well is it working? What's the evidence about it? There's almost nothing there. There's a lot, there's a lot of experience, there's a lot of practice wisdom, but there isn't a lot of hard research to base decisions on. And I think that's something that Australia needs to think about very carefully um, and as we go down this path. So we, at La Trobe, we've had a research agenda around supported decision making now for about five or six years. So we're still sort of in the early stages of building that evidence base. What we've been trying to do is to understand the experiences for people with cognitive disability of what it's like to receive support. How do they experience support in its different sorts of forms? And what's the experience for the people that are providing that support? In an attempt to try and identify then what are the factors that underpin the delivery of effective support for decision making? And I'll talk about some of the findings a bit later on. We've also been trying to understand what can be learned from the programs about delivering support, things like the pilots that have happened over the last few years, and then to try and develop and evaluate resources to, make, to help supporters to provide support much more effectively, um, to try and develop some sort of evidence base around capacity building education programs for supporters. Because when you look out there around Australia, there's lots of nice packages telling you how to do it, but most of those are based purely and simply on ideology with very little research and evidence to underpin them. So if we think about decision making support in Australia, we are down the path of legal reform, but it's still not there. There's a lot of commitment to it, but there's no jurisdiction at the moment where people who would be deemed not to have capacity to make decisions uh, can enter into some sort of formal support for decision making agreement. People who have, who have declining capacity can make agreements ahead of time, enduring powers of attorney, for when they may be deemed to have lost their capacity. But for people who may not have capacity in that legal sense, there is no formal uh, law that governs, governs providing support for decision making. So we're on the path to it. Um, and, and, and legal reform would give a sense of legal standing to supporters, which is what people are very concerned about. It would also give standing to things like shared decision making. So a decision would be made shared between the person and their supporters. So we've started to use the term support for decision making to avoid the, the confusion. There is no formal supported decision making scheme in Australia. It's a, legal, it's a legal concept, supported decision making. So we tend to use the term support for decision making, which there's many elements of that that happen all day, every day in people's lives. And it's a much easier thing to sort of understand and begin to shape. And as the law changes, uh, language will, should begin to change too. So between 2010 and 2015, there were six pilot projects uh, across Australia that were funded by various bodies which have started to look at the delivery of support for decision making. And we think that by looking at those you can learn something about the practice of support for decision making, you can learn something about the program models that work and the costs and benefits of those different models. So what we've done, and it's been a fairly thankless task, is to look at the big body of what we call grey literature um, about those pilot projects, which are reports, documents, web, uh, you know, commentaries, all those sorts of things, and try and look at that literature and say, what can we learn from that and what are the implications uh, for the future that we can take out of that? So we've done a fairly rigorous uh, academic analysis of all of that material. And for those of you who aren't sure, there's, 
there's been six pilots. There's one in South Australia that we've called South Australian One, which was assisted by the Office of the Public Advocate. There was one in the ACT, which was assisted by an advocacy organisation called Atticus. There was one in Victoria that was auspiced by the Office of the Public Advocate. One in New South Wales that was auspiced by the Department of Family and Community Services. Another one in South Australia that was auspiced by the Health and Community Services Complaints Authority. And then a relatively small one in WA, which was auspiced by a small non-government organisation. So there's been a big range of those programs. And there are now probably four other programs that are uh, happening at one in New South Wales, another one in South Australia, um, two in New South Wales. So there's other things happening that are still in their early days. So if you look at those six programs that we've got data on, they're all very small. So they range from having six to 36 decision makers, so six to 36 people involved in those projects. They were all time limited, so they only lasted between one and two years and then the program finished, so they weren't ongoing programs. They were all non-statutory, so there was no standing to the supporters, but they all had fairly similar aims, so they were about enabling people to have more control over their own decisions. And they, they were trying to trial models of supported decision making with particular groups of people. And they, they aimed too to develop resources for supporters. One of the problems was that most of those programs had a fairly opaque program logic. So the sort of logic of what are the inputs, what's the process, what are the outputs, what's the cost, there was no, it was really hard to get hold of that sort of logic, which enables you to then cost those programs. And the design was, was slightly different in each of those programs, but it, it centered around the idea of a decision-making diet so the person with disability and a supporter who at the centre of it um, are providing support and then they delivered support to that dyad in different ways. Either there was a coordinator who delivered direct support to the dyad or there was a two-step process which happened in ACT where the coordinator spent a lot of time with the people with disabilities getting them to be decision ready and then providing, then finding somebody to support them and then supporting the dyad. Or in South Australia, which was a much more dispersed model, where the coordinator recruited facilitators who then worked with a couple of dyads in the agencies in which they work. So we've got some different sort of models beginning to happen. And what are the skills that those coordinators who were providing the support to the dyads uh, actually needed and had. So the one in Victoria, there was a, a social worker who had a PhD who'd worked for many years in the disability sector. In WA there was a project officer who worked for a much shorter time and we don't know anything about what their qualifications were. So there's not a lot of information there to base, make some judgments about. There was also very little about the output, so how many decisions were made out of these programs. But we know a bit more about the decision makers. So the majority of people that have been involved in these trials to date have been people with intellectual disabilities. The vast majority have been that group and there's a smaller group of people with acquired brain injury. So to our knowledge, there haven't been any pilots that have focused on people with dementia or older people. And they've been targeted at the, at the moment into specific subgroups, people who are at risk of, risk of guardianship, people with complex support needs, and people who were socially isolated with no informal support at all in Victoria. And the supporters for the dyad have been recruited through people's either existing social networks um, and uh, in relationships that are freely given or in paid relationships. So in some of the projects they've included paid workers. And they've also been recruited as volunteers, as people who have had no prior relationship, no prior contact with the person. So there's a whole spread of different situations that have happened, so that those are beginning to be tested. And most of them, as I said before, have developed resources. So what do these evaluations tell us? Five of the six programmes actually had a formal evaluation report, so that was quite useful. But the important thing to remember is that those evaluations were very small 
Um, they were primarily descriptive, they didn't have ethics approval, and they were probably not, not rigorous in terms of the sort of evidence level you would expect to be able to publish something and say, we, we know this works. But the main themes that come out of the, that collection of evaluations is that providing support decision making in these types of programs actually has positive outcomes for the decision maker in terms of their confidence and skills and for the supporters in terms of their, their suggestion that they're changing their perception and their approach to the person with disability. So, and the other issue is that it was feasible in a couple of programs they had a couple of people who was, were under guardianship but there was evidence that having a support Support, supporter as a sort of uh, preliminary to the guardian making a decision actually worked. So you can have a supporter as part of a, of a guardianship order, um, which is really quite useful when you think about the people who are in New South Wales, many of whom in, in the large institutions have guardians who have huge caseloads who don't know the person really from a bar of soap. But what these programs have shown is that you can have a support for decision making uh, program which will enable to feed into the decisions that the guardian may make on that person's behalf. One of the issues that came out very strongly though was the uncertain boundaries about what decision support actually was. The experience from the supporters was that they had difficulties getting their decisions acted on and I think there's a, a bit of comment about that but it was also opposition from other people involved in the person's support network um, and conflict with other people in that person's support network. Um, questions about where does this decision maker stand in relation to everybody else? And then does this decision making support extend to advocacy to get the decision acted on? Um, when, does it, when does the boundaries between advocacy, decision making support and case management, where do those things sort of lie? So those are some of the issues that have come out of these programs. The other one which will come as no surprise to most people is the difficulty of finding supporters. So for people who don't have already strong family connections or informal uh, advocates, finding people, even people that know that person who are willing to take on the role of decision supporter is incredibly time consuming and difficult. And in Victoria, the program worked with the Office of the Public Advocate who drew on their existing body of very experienced volunteers. And yet half of the people who put their hands up dropped out after the first information session and said, this is, this is too full on for us, the expectations are too much. So finding friends is central to some of these programs. The positive value of the program staff and support was the other theme that came out, that these programs worked because the supporters and the person with a disability to some extent too actually valued the assistance and the support they got from the staff members, from the coordinator, who helped them negotiate their relationships, help them think about expectations and clarify their roles. So supporters find it really hard to do this stuff on their own and value that external support. And having a coordinator also helped with continuity when somebody lost their, their supporter. Again, these last two are probably really unexceptional in terms of they found there's very limited experience of people and expectations of people uh, at, in people's social networks about the ability of people with disabilities to make decisions. We've got a long way to go in terms of changing community attitudes and expectations about people being able to participate in decision making. And that there was also incredibly variable value accorded to the written resources that these programs made available. So what can we learn overall from these programs? I think importantly, there's very positive outcomes that can be achieved, even for people who've got guardians. They've demonstrated the potential of decision-making support for people who are socially isolated, but we need to know more about how to recruit people, how to retain volunteers, and how to mentor volunteers. They've identified a lot of key issues that need to be resolved as we move down the track of support for decision making. It's also shown that operating in the sort of informal civil society without any legal mandate or any legal standing is fairly problematic. 
Um, so there's a sense that this is some demonstration that we need to move to some sort of formal or quasi-legal scheme that will help to define the standing and some of those difficult boundary issues about support for decision making. It's demonstrated though the value of a programmatic approach that embeds training and support to supporters. Um, it's also demonstrated that support for decision making is an ongoing, lengthy, time consuming process and it's not something that can be done alone or something that can be done quickly and I'm sure the people in the audience who provide support to people to make decisions will know that. It's not a one-off thing that you do, it's a long-term process. So in terms of understanding, so that's, that's what we've learned I think from these pilots. Um, and th this is really the sort of first overarching analysis of, of all of those. In terms of the understanding of the experience of decision making support, we've, been, we've done a series of studies which have been looking at support for people with acquired brain injury and their supporters and we've done less in the field of intellectual disability because there's, a, there's another PhD student who's actually gone to Canada and looked at the support that's happening over there and her thesis is getting there. So we'll have some more evidence uh, in a little while. Um, but what's come out of that series of studies is the complexity of the support process and its importance in maintaining a sense of self for the person with disability. It's not unimportant to be in control of decisions in your life and to participate in them, whether they're little decisions or big decisions. And that the individual has to be central to the decision making process. The danger is that person-centred has become one of those, you know, spray-on words like community used to be, but we need to maybe find another term for that, but the person has to be at the centre of this process. That it's really important that the decision-making support strategies depend on the context and depend on the decision. So you use different strategies for different decisions in different contexts that there has to be an ongoing commitment to knowing the person well and understanding their preferences and how they may change over time and their changing needs. There needs to be a positive support relationship but it doesn't have to be you know, the ideal support relationship. Everybody has ups and downs in relationships but there has to be a strong commitment there. And there has to be a positive approach to taking risks. You can't be completely risk averse in these types of relationships. Importantly too, it's a shared process with others. Providing support for decision making isn't something that supporters do on their own. We've used the term orchestration. So a primary supporter does it in orchestration. It orchestrates the other people involved in, their per in the person's life. What we've also found from a study we did of supporters of people primarily with intellectual disabilities is the potential, the enormous potential for supporters to shape people's decisions by the way in which they present options, the things they leave out, the language that they use, and their overarching sort of paradigm